It is now 28 minutes to 7. This is Morning Express. We'd like to look at what's making headlines on the dailies before we also uh, take a focus on the way it is on the economy, the Kenyan economy, the state of the Kenyan economy. But allow me to introduce the guests that we have here this morning. And to my extreme left, I have uh, Michael Agwanda, Mr. Michael Agwanda, who's a governance expert. Good morning Good and thank morning. you for joining us. We also have Ambrose Weda, who is an advocate. Thank you for joining us, Ambrose. Well, gentlemen, I hope you had yourselves a good weekend. Sure, it is. Okay. Let's go straight into the standard. What's making headline on the standard and shocking claims on NYS theft investigator. Now, this is an interesting turn of events, given that, of course, we've had NYS focused on for now the last maybe month and a half or so. And this is to do with initially what was claimed to be 9 billion shillings that was lost, which has uh, reduced now significantly to several hundred millions. Bo bottom line is uh, money has been lost and investigations are going on. However, now a, a spanner has been thrown into the works by one gentleman, uh, one of the arrested, and that's a uh, gentleman who claims that Mike Muir, who is uh, the senior, one of the senior investigators of this particular case, was his business partner, which of course would then mean that uh, the case or the investigations would already somehow be compromised by conflict of interest. Let me start with you, Mr. Gwanda, on your thoughts on this. Of course, uh, it is claims that he is making he has given um, bank slips, which he claims are transfer of money that he made to the, this Mr. Mike Muir, who is uh, the chief investigator for this particular case. Uh, but your thoughts on that? Good morning, viewers. Um, Mike, this is um, a situation where the country will have to look further into the circumstances on where this allegation has been made. But most importantly, if it is even found to be just a little truth in it, then it will be very difficult to prosecute this case. And many lawyers will tell you that it will be dead on arrival. If at all, the allegation by Gidenji that uh, the chief uh, investigator in this case, in NYS2, is actually one of his partners, business partners, in this case in Atlantic Nowhere, as I was reading through it, actually, they're, they're not just allegation of him being a partner to Gidenji, but uh, also for asking for sexual favors uh, that, that, uh, from, from the sisters and asking to record uh, <coughs> statements within his confines, I mean, the confines of his house. And, and sometimes statements starting from 9 o'clock and ending about 3 o'clock, I mean, a.m., I mean, p.m., is just not what you want to do. Statements are not necessarily, I've, I've not had cases where uh, statements are taken at the, the investigator's home, but uh, they will always summon you to the police station uh, to write statements, and if necessary, they could come to your office, but not in the investigator's home. Again, all these are allegations. But my fear is, if there is even a little hint of truth in this, then this case is dead on arrival, simply because if the private invest, I mean, the, the invest, chief investigator in this case is still handling the NYS case, then there will be no truth in it. I mean, he's accepting that he got some money, got some check, that he's also alleging that bounce. And now uh, we are seeing a situation of a relationship here that is also not explaining very clearly how this relationship came about. My biggest fear is this is how we lose cases. Remember, it is the investigators who put the watertight case to the DPP, and the DPP looks at it, and after looking at it, it will form an opinion whether this will be able to... Uh, to, before, to a court of law. before a court of law or not. Now, if it is even having doubts that the investigator must have not done a very good job, or even was related in this case in some way, the best he could have done was to withdraw withdraw from this case and have somebody else investigate. And I hope that is what um, his bosses are going to do, that they will uh, temporarily stop him from investigating these cases and have somebody else investigate this All right. case. Um, Ambrose, you're a lawyer, and your thoughts, is this a case that possibly would be DOA, as they call it, dead on arrival, or 
is there still a chance that should there be, like uh, Michael Agwanda says, some truth in this, um, a possibility of this particular investigator being withdrawn, uh, give somebody else the case and they carry on? Uh, uh, first of all, it will not be dead on arrival. When the thieves say, uh, I didn't steal alone, I still, I still, we were with Gatonga. Now Gatonga was interviewing me now. That's good. <laughs> we should just then record the statements and, if possible, charge the fellow also. So, oh, so you are co-conspirators. It, it is, let's view the positive side, that those who have stolen are saying, indeed we stole, but we are not alone. We are with so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. That is the positive part. It does not matter. There's no conflict of interest in investigations. Mm -hmm. What is required is have you brought out facts which prove an offense? Mm -hmm. Now, if the facts exist and they are presented, even if you say that so and so used to be my enemy, so and so is my co accomplice, that does not kill the case. Why do I say so? Even the NYS case, I have said here before and I repeat, you don't have to charge the 50, the 100 people. Mm -hmm. You select a few, the core ones, the motors, the big ones, the big fish, the sharks. Then the omenas, who are also equally guilty, mm -hmm. become witnesses. Do you get it? Mm -hmm. It is a common practice. Sometimes you say, we will give you, a, we will not charge you, but you will be a witness in this case against these people. Mm -hmm. That's how we nail, because thieves work together. You are not there. So how do you know how they have worked? You get some of the thieves. You send a thief to catch a thief. So this is a good case where the DPP and the, 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 the head of the, the, the investigation, the DCIO, should replace this fellow, mm -hmm. record statements. And if offenses are revealed, bang also those ones in court. It will be a good fight. It would be a good demonstration in the fight against corruption. But we must also be live that where are millions, where are half a billion passes. There are so many people. You can't remove money from government unless so many are involved, including clerks, mm. including and, and, messengers. And, and unfortunately, chances for that kind of money to be changing hands are that they're very well connected, yes. very high level uh, players in yes. this particular case. Yes. So that should be expected. Mr. Gwanda, do you feel like we are finally making some steps towards this war on corruption, given that there has been a consistent follow up on this particular case? And we've had quite a number of names recently. We had, uh, although on a different level, um, governors who possibly would be arraigned in court on charges of corruption. Do you feel like Kenya is finally making strides towards fighting corruption? Recently, I had the DPP say this under court. He said that we have enough laws to uh, deal with issues of corruption, except that there was no goodwill from the top. And then he said there is now goodwill from the top. And he based his uh, hope on the goodwill from the top. If that continues and with the pressure of ensuring uh, that cases are followed up to their logical conclusion within the shortest time possible also at the courts of law, then we can see a light at the end of the day. My biggest fear, however, is when we have investigators that are actually leading the investigation in such magnitude of cases and of corruption involve, then I have a fear uh, that perhaps we may not see a very good end of it. However, there is a practice world over of having enticing whistleblowers and people who have information to incriminate or to help tighten the case. Most cases, those people in other countries like USA, you will be given a minimal sentence or be set free in exchange of that information that is valid. I think Kenya, we need to move from just uh, knowing that there are whistleblowers there and having a witness protection um, you know, law in place that perhaps is not even being implemented well to a point where we can start rewarding mm -hmm. people that are giving us information uh, in line with the corruption in this country. For example, I'm just saying, if, if perhaps you uh, an art and uh, money stolen worth a hundred million maybe uh, you know 
a tenth of it or uh, you know maybe a quarter of it can come to help you and in that you are awarding people who are giving information about corruption in this country and when you award them more cases will come out with people that are involved with them or give them an immunity of jail so that when they release information that Mike Agwanda stole X amount of money and I have evidence that they will be able to be given something as support. The problem we have in this country has been that uh, uh, now corruption is more of a career uh, than just uh, stealing. People are rewarded to be corrupt in this country. For example, you steal 100 million, and the next day you go to the village and people sing for you, and you become the MP or the governor. Or, and, and so we are propelling corruption and rewarding it with the higher offices in this country. I wish we will be able to go a step forward and say, look, if you know of an information about an individual that was involved in this corruption, and as Weda has said, let me tell you, people know one another, thieves know themselves, and they know how much they took and when they took it and who was given what. Why can't we reward those people with those kind of information? Until we can reward those people, we are still going to just hear about this corruption when somebody gets annoyed. And for your information, we do hear about this corruption when somebody gets annoyed. And secondly, I want to say this. Until we also act on what the Auditor General gives us every year, mm. from the counties, from the central government, from the military, from the police, and every government sector, and say, this is what has happened, and make sure that heads rolls when the Auditor General says the money that was stolen here or they cannot be accounted for, we will not see this war end. There are some legitimate things that we must do. Follow up on Auditor Generals and make sure that people are arrested. I hope, just like the DPP said, that there is will from the top now to fight corruption, that it will continue and we'll see genuine fight on corruption. All right, Ambrose Weda, do you think there's goodwill from the top when you see what's happening? Because there are those uh, skeptics who say that there is really nothing new. All we're seeing is a few arrests, a lot of noise right now. Then before we know it, something else comes up and we forget all this. I think when you, the, the top here, basically we mean the president. Correct. And when you look at the body language, you look at the face, you look at the words, the president is angry. And that anger is what we call the goodwill. Mm. The rest are technical. The DPP has the technical part, the other advisors. So that goodwill comes in when he also says, I will not protect anybody. Please get them. And when you get them, we have enough laws. If you take, for instance, the law called abuse of office. Mm. Abuse of office is basically conferring a benefit to somebody. So if in my office, in your office, you allow me to benefit or you confer that benefit, you give me a tender irregularly, that's abuse of office, as long as I gain something. So there are enough laws. Where we have reached, the moment you see uh, we, we, we go for peace, and if we could get two, three cabinet secretaries, uh, the, the, the shock mm. will, will live on the shock for another five years, because the fear would actually be there. Yeah. It is this big guy. You cannot remove a billion shillings unless it is from the top. And Correct. it is shared by everybody. Mm. There's no way some clerks would reach that amount. And what he says, the whistleblowers need to be paid. And you know the whistleblowers? Some of these people do photocopies in the office. Those who do <coughs> deliver, they know. They see the checks. The ones who carry the check here, they are the ones who carry the documents here, they, they see them and they know he, this is theft, they know it. And that's why some of them, when they are sacked or when they're annoyed or when they feel bad, then they come out and say, okay, it is time. So where we are going, I think there's a lot of hope mm. if we can sustain it for a long time. For a long time, all right. And we'll wait and see as those investigations span out, of course, right here on KTN News. We certainly are keeping our eyes on that and uh, we'll keep you posted as there's any development regarding corruption and the NOI scandal specifically. On page eight, we also have an interesting story there where 29 governors who failed to grow revenue. And this, um, some of the governors who 
failed to do this, still came back to office, but this was 29 governors who failed to grow their revenue base in the 2016-2017 financial year. Now, the remaining 18 who did were rewarded with $6.3 billion to be shared between them. Of course, this is not to their pockets, but to the counties. Uh, but, Michael Aguanda, you're a governance expert, and what should this be one of the, uh, what should we call it, scorecards that one should use to see whether a governor is actually working, if they can grow their revenue from their county, because if they depend on purely on national uh, revenue, the, what is shared out, then chances of that county growing beyond a certain level are very minimal because that money is, um, well, quite spread out, and especially most of it being used on recurrent expenses, mainly salaries. Mike, <clears throat> corruption has been devolved to the counties, the most unfortunate thing. Whatever is happening at the national government is also happening at the county government. The problem is the governors, most of them, and the executives um, in the counties are now so busy chasing money from the central government. And their officers are so busy ensuring that money that is coming from central government must come. And let me tell you, sometimes it is dispersed within three months, uh, sometimes it is also stagnated on the basis of the projects that they're doing and such like. And so their account department are constantly preparing papers to make sure that they validate what is needed at the central government for them to get the big check. That in itself negates the zeal and the seriousness that collecting local revenues will also require. Mm. But when you look at the other side of it also, you realize that there are also different schools of thought as to whether a county is able to collect revenue from within uh, their counties. And two schools of thoughts have been shared. One is that this money is collected and it is not deposited. It's shared among the big guys within the counties. And that is the money that actually is getting to the hands of some of the governors who are well corrupt. And, and those are the monies that find themselves in the Arambis, where money is collected from, from, from the field. And it goes into somebody's pocket straight away, used for Arambi and appeasing uh, some of the MCAs around. Because it is not audit, uh, it's not really you know, checked beyond uh, you know, you know, the way it's supposed to be. But uh, there's also another theory that, that uh, you know, we're too busy chasing the big money from the central government. We have no time to push our residents to, 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 to give this money. So a lot of effort is put into what is known and, and the big check that will be used for various uh, you know, you know, reasons and development in this area. And so this little one that is, you know, it's 100,000, it's 50,000, it's 20,000. Oh, you know, let's not concentrate on that. Let's concentrate on the big money. And you know that collection of revenue in the local counties is so bad if we can hear that only 18 counties out of 47 are able to collect even enough revenue or, or even near to what they collected in the last uh, uh, you know, financial year. I really think that this is a game. It's a game of chase. Mm -hmm. It's a game where basically they're collecting the money, using it, and not depositing in the account so that it can be audited by the auditor general so that it's not in the purview of the government or watchdog so that the, the that EACC does not pockets. look at it. Mm. And, and it's just a way of stealing money from the county. It's not that uh, last financial year people have died so much or have lost business so much that they cannot pay revenue All right. uh, in the subsequent <laughs> Whether years. should that be a scorecard or a way of checking governors if they cannot increase revenue? Because well, that's why, well, that would probably be one of the best ways to grow counties when they're able to collect account and utilize uh, revenue collected from within. This culture of uh, we give you money, uh, extra money, and so on and so forth uh, is wrong. Uh, if you look at the constitution, the counties have so much work. Mm. And the revenues are supposed to be generated as they render services. It is like they sell the services. You supply water, people pay for it. From there, you gather. You uh, collect garbage, people pay for it. it That's how it's supposed to be. It is not supposed to be waiting for money from the national government, or, and then if you collect enough, then you are given more. The 
this works because, uh, in, in that way because most of the people we elect, we elect them either on the basis of party or tribe or uh, the kind of money they, 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 they're they, able to throw around. They're able to throw around. Mm. So until we become hungry for services, until we become angry that services must be rendered so that when you seek office, then we say, are you able to deliver? Mm. So the, nobody should use our money to reward people. Just because they, they collected some little money. You look, at, you look at some counties and there is no work going on. Work which would generate so, so much Revenue. money. Okay. And, uh, well, we'll wait and see how those governors are going to uh, have that done. Let's also look at page 11, security tighter at Moy Girls Schools reopened. And this, of course, is on the backdrop of an incident that took place in the school where a girl was raped and, of course, security becoming a major concern. And not just in this school, but in other schools. But as they go back to school, have lessons been learned? And not just in Moy Girls, but in other schools, that security is uh, something that should be paramount, especially for parents who release their children to go to school, and you expect that that's a place, should be a safe heaven for them. Uh, whether your thoughts on whether this has taught us a lesson? I think it should. I, drawing from my experience as chairman of the Board of Governors of the Girls High School, one of the biggest, with over 2,000 girls, mm. first of all, it should be noted that second term going to third term, insecurity issues increase. Mm. And the incidences of fire, the incidences of the girls and boys seeing the devil, and there are many things. And this could be related to exams. Hallucinations <laughs> and so on and so forth. There are also lies being spread and fear and panic. So that the teachers and the board, they upgrade their management. They upgrade. I remember now in our school, we have added now armed security. We also teach the girls to keep together. We don't want lone people sneaking into the dawn at, uh, at wee hours alone. Mm. We want, when people go for preps, it is preps. When people go for lunch, all these things together, you are each other's keeper. keeper. And then we keep on talking, we keep on addressing, we keep on bringing people to talk and to pray together and to focus together. Some of the issues you see like um, Moy girls, they will not come if management has not fallen short mm. of their expectation. The, the principal and the teachers. Then the board also. The board can always only come to eat chicken. You know, when the board of governors come to school, there's a good cooking and, there's, uh, <laughs> and, and the school is very tense. You, you find it uh, and then they come and they read roughly the, the, the papers and then they go home. This lapses where we have gone. It is good that uh, the board was sacked and uh, they should also be arraigned in court. I'm saying even me, if we reach there, we should be sacked. Mm. And then uh, arraigned in court and say, whether you purported to be chairman? And what actions did you take so that we prevent this? Looking at where we are in the world today, looking at America, people walking into schools with guns and killing, looking at terrorism, any time it could be targeted, we require tough measures that mm -hmm. involve everybody and schools now should be out of bounds for strangers all right and i think yes. I'll, I'll have to cut you short there right there because of time and would like to release our ktn home viewers because life and style is just about to begin but on ktn news we're going to take a short break when we come back we're looking at the state of the economy remember thursday is going to be the day where the nation is going to be focused on uh, uh, parliament as the budget is being read so uh, we take a short break right now right here on ktn news but on ktn home we say goodbye for life and style to begin ktn news will be right back with the state of the economy economy.